Good evening, everyone, and thank you for all joining us here tonight um, for this webinar on the corridor selection uh, process. My name is Nancy Joseph. Um, I am the Community and Stakeholder Engagement Manager for the project. Tonight, we're going to hear from Barton Napier about the significant volume of work that has been done um, and the process used to select the final corridor for this project. On behalf of everyone here, uh, here with us today, we acknowledge the various traditional owners on the lands on which we all meet today and pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. We also acknowledge those Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples that may be with us tonight. What we're gonna to cover uh, tonight, the format will consist of a presentation uh, from Barton Napier, who is the senior principal at Tetra Tech Coffee. This will be followed by a question and answer session. Specifically, Barton is gonna take us through the process for selecting the single corridor, which will include the corridor selection process uh, using existing easements uh, and underground technology. And that will be followed by a question and answer session. Before we begin some housekeeping, there are many uh, participants in this webinar. So therefore all we have muted all participants. If you'd like to submit a question to Barton, please use the chat function, uh, which is located at the bottom of the screen window. Inappropriate language and personal attacks in the chat won't be tolerated tonight. Not all questions will be able to be answered today. Uh, and we acknowledge that there will be some outstanding questions. So they will be updated in the frequently asked questions tab um, on the project website. If you have any questions that are not related to this topic, then they will be passed on to the relevant specialist for upcoming web webinars in the future two weeks. And this session will finish um, at 8.30 p.m. tonight. So as I said, tonight we're gonna to hear from Barton Napier, who is the Senior Principal at Tektra Tech Coffee. Barton has led environmental approvals for major projects, both nationally and internationally, and is one of the leading specialists in Australia on route selection projects, such as this project. Barton started his career with the State Electricity Commission of Victoria, and has more than 30 years experience working on transmission and other infrastructure. I'm now going to hand over to you, Barton. Thank you very much, Nancy, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As Nancy has explained, this evening I'm going to take you through the corridor selection process that's been conducted and is partly through its process for the Western Victoria Transmission Network project. As Nancy has outlined, I will talk about the selection process, about utilising existing, existing transmission line easements, about utilising the Western Freeway, Western Highway Corridor, and spend some time talking about underground technology. The corridor selection process is focused on identifying suitable corridors and ultimately suitable routes for a double circuit, 220 kV or 500 kV or combination there of transmission line. The Transmission lines shown in the right of this image is a double circuit 500 kV transmission line. Some important context in relation to corridor and ultimately route selection is that unlike road and rail transport corridors in and around Melbourne, which have been protected by reservations or planning overlays, now land use planning has not considered what is deemed to be strategic electricity or gas transmission infrastructure. Consequently, existing corridors are highly congested and often highly constrained. Within those corridors, we have competing interests and priorities uh, between what the asset owner desires to use the corridor for and maintain it for 
future expansion, et cetera, and, and what we might want to do in terms of utilising it for other infrastructure. An example of this is the photo at right, which shows the Sydenham to Mirabal 500 kV transmission lines running down past Caroline Springs. And as you can see, residential development has uh, grown up to the edge of the easement on this transmission line corridor, effectively closing off opportunities to expand that door. Longer routes do increase cost. Uh, linear infrastructure is, is highly um, dependent or highly contingent on cost, on sorry, length. Um, and obviously we're seeking and do seek the shortest feasible route. It's important to understand that the shortest feasible route doesn't usually end up that way because uh, we need to deal with constraints, which I'll talk about in a minute. And in my experience um, of over 5,000 kilometres of linear infrastructure site and route selection throughout Australia and internationally, there is no perfect route, whether it's in urban environments, whether it's in rural, regional, or whether it's in very remote outback and um, tropical rainforest um, environments. All routes have what we call pinch points and that are they are areas where we have very high constraints or high constraints, which simply have to be crossed at some point to enable areas of less constraint to be linked up to create a corridor and ultimately a route. And how we deal with the high constraints is, determines the feasibility ultimately of the project and its environmental and um, planning approvals. And that is how the constraints are managed. So just to recap on the process itself, it involves starting with point A and point B being the two points to be connected and with a straight line between those points. We then use constraints mapping to identify corridors, taking into consideration strategic constraints like highly sensitive environmental areas or, te or for technically challenging country for the particular type of infrastructure that's being proposed. Once that process has been done and we've identified corridors and then evaluated the least constrained corridor, we then identify prudent and feasible routes within that corridor. And then we take into consideration site-specific constraints, which are what we call tactical constraints. The routes are then evaluated against prudent and feasible, uh, against route and site selection criteria which consider the technical specification, constructability of the proposed infrastructure, and then obviously environmental, cultural and socioeconomic criteria. We look for key differentiators between the, the alternatives that are being considered to identify those that are material to the decision on which should be the least constrained route. And then once that route is, is identified, it's then refined in consultation with the landowners and land managers across whose land it passes. On the right there, you can see a diagram which shows that the process is related also and progresses as more and more information becomes available. So initially we start with desktop studies when we're looking at the corridors, we then move into technical studies to evaluate the corridors to arrive at a least constrained corridor and then ultimately uh, routes. And then we also take into consideration engineering investigations as the corridor and then the routes are defined. Throughout this process, um, we take on board uh, and progressively refine and iterate um, to address community, government agency, local government and industry feedback on, on issues that we may have not been aware of uh, through the process as it develops. The constraints mapping that was done for this project is shown in this, this slide and you can see there two white lines. The first one is the 
the straight line between Bulgana and Sydenham Terminal Station, which obviously is the most direct way of getting from Bulgana to Sydenham. The second line is an alternative way of getting to from Bulgana to Sydenham if it was desired to go via Warbra, which is the case for this project, which is considering two options, a 22500 option and a 500 kV option. As you can see there, the constraints mapping within the area of interest has already taken into consideration some major strategic constraints being the, the Wombat State Forest, Lerderderg uh, State Park, Brisbane Ranges National Park to the south. And as we progress further to the west, um, Mount Cole, um, Mount Beckworth, et cetera. The constraints mapping that you see there indicates the areas of high constraint in red, uh, moderate constraint in yellow, and low constraint in green. And the objective is to link up those areas of low and moderate constraint to develop and, and define corridors. And as you can appreciate, there are in some situations areas of high constraint, uh, crossing areas where you might link up corridors, and they are what we, we defined earlier and spoke about as pinch points. A lot of work was done to analyze the various corridors and identify those and to arrive at the shortlisted corridors, which you see in the, in the slide here. There are a couple of corridors which fell away early on, and that was the one that continued down here through between Creswick and Ballarat, and corridors that came up through here along the proposed outer metropolitan ring road and across onto the existing Sydenham to Mirable 500 kV transmission line corridor. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. To enable us to move from a shortlisted corridors to a what we call a least constrained corridor or final corridor, we evaluate, we developed what we call conceptual routes. And these were not routes in the sense of the process that we saw earlier in the diagram. These were simply ways of connecting up the least constrained and moderately constrained areas to identify within that corridor um, how that would work. And then what we did was compare those, evaluate those against some 37 parameters. Um, some of which are listed in the, the matrix you see there, to understand how they impacted and were constrained by various things like tenure, resource tenure, planning and land use, uh, land use itself, uh, occupation, biodiversity, heritage, and a, and a range of parameters around constructability, watercourse crossings, et cetera. What we then did was we looked at the material differences between the options or the alternatives that we, we investigated. And we did that to identify because they actually show us um, which corridors are less or more constrained. You'll see three alternatives for each corridor there in this section, which is Warbra to Ballarat Bendigo 220 kV transmission line. And the reason they are there is that they reflect the options that were being investigated for terminal station sites north of Ballarat. So one of those uh, conceptual routes relates to the northern area, um, one to the central area, and one to the southern area without specific um, reference to sites. And as you can see there, um, based on those parameters where there were material differences, the northern corridor coming across from Warbra, um, across through Torello, north of Allendale, across into the Mount Prospect area is least constrained overall in comparison to the other corridors and sub options. We then did the same for the Ballarat to Bendigo. 2020 kV line through to Sydenham, 
And as you can see here, um, there are a number of options, further options considered, and they related to various ways of, of dealing with um, linking up the least constrained areas. And again, you see that the Northern Corridor is coming out overall as less constrained than the other, option, other alternatives that were considered. But you can see that there are a number of high constraints that, that, the, that, uh, that alternative is exposed to. And to understand why those were high constraints, whether they could be managed and how they were influencing the evaluation process, we held a series of workshops with technical specialists and we, and we looked into those high constraints in detail. That resulted in this um, diagram here, which shows levels of constraint going out from the black line in the center. So the outer ones are more highly constrained. And we focused in on the Ballarat to Bendigo uh, transmission line through to Sydenham section, um, because there were two uh, corridors in that section. The, Southern Corridor through the Parwan Valley is more highly constrained than the Northern Corridor for cultural heritage because of its length in features that are highly prospective and conducive to Aboriginal cultural heritage. And we're talking here in particular to the Stony Rises, which have typically not been developed for agriculture and therefore tend to contain more cultural heritage, Aboriginal cultural heritage, and a more prospective Another reason is that there are recorded ceremonial sites, a burial sites and other Aboriginal cultural sites of significance in and adjacent to the Southern Corridor, which we don't currently see in the Northern Corridor. For the same reason, biodiversity is more uh, constrained in the Southern Corridor or is a higher constraint in the Southern Corridor than the Northern Corridor. And it again relates to the stony rises and the associated critically endangered natural temperate grasslands of the Victorian volcanic plain. And the reason is that the Southern Corridor is a longer distance in that ecological community than the Northern Corridor, notwithstanding that in the Northern Corridor, we recognise that we have to uh, traverse or it traverses the grey box woodland around Merrimew Reservoir and Cameron's Road. Landscape and visual um, are equally constrained, but for different reasons. Obviously, the Northern Corridor in passing um, through the, across the Lerderderg Valley between Dali and the Lerderderg State Park uh, is very highly constrained. It passes um, south of the Lerderderg State Park which has been identified as a state significant landscape in the Southwest Victoria Landscape Assessment. In contrast, the Southern Corridor traverses the Parwan Valley and Rowsley Scarp. And that landscape has also been assessed under that assessment as a state significant landscape. And so the difference we have there is that one passes across and in front of the state significant landscape, the other passes and traverses through the state significant landscape. The other issue we have in the Southern Corridor is that the Yaloak South Wind Farm planning decision required that development to locate transmission and wind turbine infrastructure back from the escarpment. And so consequently, taking a transmission line up over the Rowsley Scarp, which is required to get out of the Parwan Valley, would conflict with that planning decision. So as I said, there are different drivers with both options highly constrained. I'll talk more about planning and land use in a minute. In regards to agriculture, property sizes on the Northern Corridor are typically smaller than on the Southern Corridor. With transmission infrastructure, it is a little bit easier in some instances to manage um, in, can, impacts on small, smaller properties than it is on broad acre cropping properties. It relates in part to how the infrastructure is located on the property, 
but obviously where we have multiple towers in very large paddocks and large machinery like sewing booms and that, it can have a, a higher impact on that particular farming practice. The other issue why agriculture comes up as high is because we've embodied in this uh, key differentiator, the fact that the Parwin Valley has been identified as an area of significant erosion in, a, in an agricultural context. Uh, it relates to the tunnel and piping erosion that, that is um, ongoing there and historically has happened there. And so constructing access tracks and transmission infrastructure through that environment uh, could exacerbate uh, the impact of that erosion and progress that erosion. So when we take into consideration the key differentiators that we've discussed, overall the Southern Corridor is coming out more constrained than the Northern Corridor. Noting the cor Northern Corridor has some very high constraint pinch points. Just to highlight the comments I made about biodiversity impacts and impacts on the grasslands, the red shaded areas in this slide are the endangered as listed under Victorian legislation and critically endangered um, natural temperate grasslands of the Victorian Volcanic Plain under the EPBC Act. And that has in part been sought to be protected by the environmental significance overlay schedule four there. So as you can see in this slide, the Southern Corridor is, is more in those grassland communities for much longer than the Northern Corridor. In regards to the planning, statutory planning and land use considerations, I spoke earlier about the fact that corridors for this type of infrastructure have not been considered in planning. And so consequently, the project and, and all of you who find ourselves in the situation where corridors are being closed off by urban expansion. The dark pink areas in this side are the urban growth zone. The light pink are residential areas or residential zones. The bright green is the green wedge zone. The pale or olivey green is the um, rural conservation zone. The darker green are public conservation resource zone. The turquoise color are significant landscape overlays. And the black dashed areas are precinct structure plans. They are approved for future subdivision and residential development. And as you can see in this slide, the Southern Corridor near Melton Reservoir has all but clo been closed off by recent approval of that pre uh, precinct structure plan. So that has become not only highly constrained from a land use planning perspective, it's become highly constrained from a technical feasibility and constructability perspective. In contrast, you can see that um, the Northern Corridor, while still having pinch points, is less constrained than the Southern Corridor. So having regard to that analysis and evaluation and those key differentiators and the advice of specialists and that evaluation, the least constrained corridor is the Northern Corridor from Sydenham through to the Ballarat to Bendigo transmission line along that transmission line and then north from near Mount Prospect across to Warbra and then along the existing 220 kV line between Ballarat and Horsham to Bulgana. I spoke earlier about pinch points and how they're managed and how we manage the impacts of linear infrastructure and this is the hierarchy that's applied to train electricity transmission infrastructure, where the primary mitigation is, is route design. So now that the least constrained corridor has been identified, um, route um, alternatives will be investigated. And through that process, we'll seek to maximize separation to sensitive receptors. 
reduce land use impacts on farming activities and other land uses, utilise the topography where we can to reduce landscape and visual impacts. When that has been exhausted, we then look to structure design, whether it's double circuit steel lattice towers, as you saw in the opening slide, or steel poles or single circuit uh, steel lattice towers or poles, noting that the latter uh, in, can increase the clutter of structures in the landscape. When we've exhausted that, we have a number of treatments that can be used and are utilised throughout Australia and internationally. And they include, instead of standard galvanised steel, dull galvanising, pre-weathered steel and painting, noting that the latter two have some safety and operation and maintenance implications. Conductors nowadays can be treated in some instances, um, as can insulator selection. It provides a choice of different um, shades, um, which can, can mitigate some of the visual impact. And then finally, we look at the technology solution, whether overhead or underground. A couple of examples to show how these treatments and mitigations have been applied. This is the Dartmouth Mount Beauty 220 kV transmission line passing in front of the Alpine National Park and Victoria's highest peak, Mount Bogong. There are a number of very prominent um, tourist lookouts across this valley to, to Mount Bogong and the Alpine National Park. And so when this transmission line was built in the 1980s, it was painted green to reduce its appearance in the landscape. And for those who haven't picked it, there's a transmission tower there, if you can see my cursor, and another one just in here. To give you some idea of spatial context, this photo was taken about a kilometre from that transmission line. This is another application of the mitigation. This is the Basslink project across Merriman Creek Valley in Gippsland. And in this instance, um, community consultation and preferences um, indicated that poles across the valley, as you see here, and steel lattice towers in the plantations was a, a preferable outcome and was accommodated in that project. We've had a lot of questions um, before this uh, session tonight about why we're not utilising existing transmission line easements. The photo on the right is an indication um, of that, in that we have houses abutting the easement. And so we physically don't have room to put another transmission line next to this transmission line. We also, as you'll see when I speak about underground, have very limited space to, to utilise this easement for underground infrastructure. The reason for that is that that easement that you saw there, that photo was taken just at the back of Ballarat. That transmission line is in a 40 metre wide easement. As you can see on the below there, the foundations for the tower are in some eight to 10 metres underground. And around that tower is an earth grid. And so when we take that into consideration, we have about, about 12 metres of available workspace, which as you'll see in the coming slides is very highly constrained from a safe workspace and from a physical space to install the infrastructure. We've had a lot of questions about why we aren't utilising the Western Freeway and Western Highway. There are examples of freeways and highways being utilised in Victoria and throughout Australia and internationally, but there are a number of important considerations um, before we can utilise those options. And they relate to th this diagram here. This is the typical freeway reserve in Victoria, about 100 metres wide with dual lanes either side. And important features to note here are the, excuse me, are these um, table drains and runoff zones to, to protect vehicles and drivers if they leave the road. And recently, Brife and Wire barriers here to further improve the safety of the road but they're also reserved for expanding the freeway as, as traffic volumes increase. And as you can see, 
developing infrastructure in there can constrain options for that. Noting that the Western Ring Road has infrastructure like this in that corridor. And you'll see that significant concrete walls have had to be built to protect the infrastructure from traffic um, and from drivers if they did leave the road from harm of tangling up in the infrastructure. Another really important consideration is that the easement for a 500 kV transmission line is typically around about 80 metres for double circuit and 40 metres for a 220 double circuit. And that's designed to ensure the, the appropriate electrical safety and electro, electric and magnetic field clearances for people and that. And obviously when we're in a situation like this where we have houses closer to the infrastructure, we need to raise the towers vertically or the poles vertically to achieve the separation we can't achieve horizontally. And so if you've driven along the Westgate freeway recently, you'll see some new poles and towers have been put in there and you'll, you'll notice that they're substantially higher than what you might see once they get out of that, that constrained environment. Just to give you an appreciation of space requirements, that section we just looked at was across through here. We have about 20 metres there. And so to construct either overhead or underground in this, this area here would require to close this lane to provide access to that area. If it were overhead, um, these trees which have been planted for amenity reasons for these people living behind here, would likely have to be significantly trimmed or removed um, for the conductor sway through this section. We move on to Bacchus Marsh and you can see here due to um, residential development, the freeway reserve has narrowed to around about 70 to 80 metres and consequently there's only four metres to five metres left here. And noting again that that lane would have to be closed to develop that. In terms of the significance of that and underground technology, the EES scoping requirements for this project require that um, OSNET services looks at the preferred mode of construction, overhead or underground, and the potential for partial underground construction. So partial and full undergrounding is being investigated, including prudent and feasible routes, which will be different to routes for overhead transmission lines for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Uh, constructability, obviously cost, what is the cost difference? Uh, and the technology solution, whether it's high voltage alternating current or high voltage direct current. Uh, we will consider in doing, in investigating the partial and full undergrounding Australian electricity industry standards, codes and regulations, international experience Experience, which is now considerable for high voltage direct current. Our C Gray publications, where C Gray is the electricity industry technical advisory uh, committee, uh, AEMO and OSNET experience and costings, and studies um, prepared for Mirable Shire Council and Amplitude study pro um, provided this year. Some considerations for underground technology is that train, terrain is a significant constraint. Overhead technology can span difficult terrain because the towers are approximately 450 to 500 metres apart. Uh, with underground cables and underground routes, the entire route needs to be disturbed unless we can use what we call trenchless construction methods or horizontal directional drilling where geotechnically feasible. And so consequently, slope becomes very important. Um, we cannot and design not to run across side slopes like transmission lines can because we would have to cut a very substantial road to accommodate the trenches. So we prefer to run up slopes, perpendicular, along ridges, etc. And that constrains uh, where the route can go and introduces additional length uh, over what an overhead route uh, can achieve. We use horizontal directional drilling for road, water course, and then sensitive environment crossings. As I said, we're geotechnically feasible. Typically, we need up to 30 metres to construct underground cables. Trenches are about 1.5 metres deep and up to four metres wide, wider where we have poor sandy soils. 
And to achieve the same energy transfer capacity of the overhead transmission line, we need up to nine cables per circuit. Remembering that this is a double circuit proposal, which means there are up to 18 cables required. Um, those cables are quite big in cross section and heavy. And so we can only fit about 500 to 1100 metres on a cable drum that can be transported on the public road network. And so we need to join the cables every 500 to 1100 metres. And as you'll see in the coming slides, we need heavy vehicle access with those cable drums. This is a typical cross section of what an easement and workspace looks like. Um, you can see the two trenches there and you'll note the orange colour there is what we call thermal backfill. And that's applied to the cables, um, around the cables to enable the, the cables as they heat up when they transfer energy to dissipate heat. The transmission line dissipates that heat into the air. The air also insulates the conductors on a transmission line, whereas for underground cables, they need to be heavily insulated. And so consequently, that's why they are much bigger cross section than you would see on wires above ground. The reason the two trenches are separated is again related to thermal performance of the cables. This is an example of a high voltage direct current uh, installation on the left, where you see two cables. Because of the nature of that technology, they can achieve similar energy transfers to that of HVAC using less cables. But the technology to enable the conversion from HVDC to HVAC, which is what we use, is significantly more costly than for high HVAC. There's an example there of a cable drum that would be about 30 tonnes and have on it somewhere between 500 and 1,000 metres of cable. On the right hand side there you see high voltage alternating uh, cables. Um, you can see three cables each um, side by side giving us one circuit or three phases. And you can see a substantially wider trench is required and wider separation between the, the cables. Below that diagram is a typical joint pit and each they have to be constructed, as I said, about every 500 to 1000 metres when we implement an underground uh, technology solution. So more photos. If it goes to partial undergrounding, um, because of the nature of losses on cables, there needs to be what's called reactive plant or transformers about every 25 kilometres of the nature of that diagram you, or photo you see in the top left there um, to boost the voltage to ensure that the, the losses across the entire length of the transmission circuit are manageable and within the, the, the needs of the, the system. There's another example of a high voltage AC cable trench there. That's a 400 kV, a bit less than the 500 kV proposed for this project. And as I said, because we need to join up to 18 cables, um, you effectively end up with three cable pits side by side, as you see in the bottom of that slide. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks Martin for that presentation. So we'll just move into questions now um, and we're starting to get a few questions come through into the chat function. So I'll work through some of these questions. So Barton, one of the ones that came through earlier was, can you provide uh, any more precise comparative costings um, uh, in addition to what you've just talked about? Um, I can't provide um, precise costings, um, but I can let you explain to you that from my experience, high voltage underground technologies um, start at around about six times the cost of overhead and can go up considerably from there depending on the energy transfer rating that's required. 
Um, so in my experience on the projects I've been involved in, um, at least six times uh, the cost of overhead. Thanks for that, Barton. Uh, the next question is from Matt, and Matt's asked, um, are we investigating the recently announced alternative route by the Liberal Party? The environment effects um, process requires us to look at all prudent and feasible corridors. And we are, as I explained earlier, partway through that process on the basis of the business case that's been put forward. We are aware of a number of alternative routes that have been proposed by community members of which that is one, being the one proposed by the, the, the Liberal Party. And so we will be giving some attention to those um, to, to see and compare those to the, the options that are being considered. Thank you. Um, there's a question um, from Jane, which I can answer this question. Uh, yes, we, we are recording these webinars and yes, they will be posted uh, on the website shortly after um, each of the webinars coming up. So that is a yes, we will be posting these recordings. Um, a question from Sam, have you considered uh, the visual impact from Dali? We have. Um, the, there is a significant landscape overlay on Swans Road, which is protecting the ridge line and hilltops. Um, that is the purpose of that overlay. There are significant landscape overlays to the east on the volcanic cones and further west around Ballarat on the volcanic cones. So we have considered that in the context of land use planning. As I said, one of the parameters that we looked at were all the planning controls, uh, zones and overlays. And we looked at, at key differences of those. And yes, the significance landscape overlay at Dali was identified. And it contributes to that constraint that was, was identified in that area. It is a high constraint and the work that will continue or proceed from now, um, we'll need to test whether that, that constraint can be effectively managed. And so that is the work that's currently underway in looking at uh, feasible routes within that corridor and whether they can be um, designed and whether the infrastructure can be designed in a way that it manages the requirements of that overlay. Okay, thank you. Um, Margaret has asked a question uh, in and around the potato growing area. So asking if we can avoid the potato growing area um, and it's the productive, that area is a productive food bowl of Victoria. Uh, we, 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 can, we fully understand Margaret's concerns and, and the fact that it is a quite an extensive um, area, the potato growing area, it extends from um, down near near Dean through Newland Mount Prospect and out to Torello in the West. One of the difficulties we, we've encountered in the work that's been done to date and the information we have available to us is that, as you would appreciate, there was a corridor that looked at passing between Creswick and Ballarat. And that corridor and the existing Ballarat to Horsham transmission line corridor through there are very highly constrained um, and um, difficult to manage, very difficult to manage from some respects because in the areas there, there is just no space. And so obviously with that very high constraint there over some considerable distance, moving into agricultural land um, produces more flexibility but it does require us as we look to progress the route selection to uh, take on board the concerns of, of, of growers in that area, in particular to how the infrastructure might be sited, not to, to impact on or constrain their current operations. Thanks, Barton. Um, the next question is from Ben, uh, and this is about land care groups. There's a number in the area. Um, are we going to avoid areas that are already been planted out by land, land care groups? Uh, we certainly will endeavour to do that. Um, one of the advantages of overhead transmission line infrastructure is that depending on the topography, 
In other words, the relative height between, for example, some of the water courses that have been planted out, and we are aware of those, um, we can overfly um, some what we call riparian vegetation or vegetation along water courses. So we are very mindful of um, the work that's being done right across the, the area of interest by land care groups, and we'll be working to to avoid where we can or to minimise impacts on, on the work that's being done. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Georgia and George has asked, um, why are we not going through Geelong? Um, there are a number of reasons um, we're not going through Geelong. Um, firstly, um, as you would appreciate from the land use planning uh, slide I put up earlier and this very opening picture, that residential development uh, between uh, Caroline Springs and Melton has effectively closed off that corridor to expansion. We are not in a position to take those transmission lines out of service um, to, to replace them with uh, double circuit transmission lines uh, because of the, the load that's on the system in the west of Melbourne, the increasing load that's coming on. And so the difficulty is getting from Sydenham to Geelong the issue then is um, consolidating the infrastructure in one spot um, doesn't create what we call geographic diversity in, this, in the network. And there is good reasons why we want to have that. So for example, if you look at the Latrobe Valley in Gippsland, um, which has been the power, the major generation um, area of Victoria for the last 40 or 60 years, it has three transmission corridors coming back to Melbourne to diversify the uh, network in that area. So that if one area or corridor was to be um, uh, fail or be damaged in a way that it caused it to fail, the other two corridors can carry the load. At the moment in Western Victoria, we have um, one corridor from Sydenham to um, Mirabool near Geelong, and then we have two corridors from there into Western Victoria, one up through Ballarat and one out through Mortlake and down to Portland. And the difficulty from a system point of view of putting additional transmission lines, particularly of this sort of capacity next to some of those corridors is that you start to consolidate all of your network infrastructure in one or two locations, which is not desirable. Thanks, Barton. Uh, the next question comes from Ron. It's just about timing of the final route. Can you give us an indication of when uh, the final route uh, is going to be um, announced or decided? Certainly, Nancy. As Osnet has previously advised, its intention is to be in a position to announce the, the proposed route um, in around about November this year. And that's is still some way away, but as you might appreciate from the process diagram I put up, uh, the route, the proposed route will be informed by technical studies that are underway. It will be informed by ongoing feedback from your, yourselves and government stakeholders and other parties. And so at the moment we're working through um, looking at route options and taking all that on board um, to be in a position to share a proposed route later this year in notionally in November. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Gabrielle and it's uh, about the underground cables. So if the cables do go underground, um, what does that then stop people from doing on top of that land? Uh, can, can you farm on it, drive on it, um, those sorts of uh, activities on the land? Certainly. Um, with underground cables and overhead transmission lines, there are some restrictions on land use and activities um, for electrical safety reasons. Uh, with underground cables, um, that can limit uh, deep rooted crops and trees. Um, we don't want those in interfering with the thermal backfill and changing the dis heat dissipating properties around the cables. And so trees and deep rooted um, 
plants and that are discouraged or, or not, not allowed over underground cable easements. We can't build silage um, uh, heaps or put silage bales over underground cable easements. And the reason for that is it's a, like an electric blanket. It heats up the cable in that section and, and what we call differentially heats the cable. So in a worst case, you get a very hot spot and the cable will fail. And so placing structures, placing um, silage, placing silage bales, uh, placing other materials over, over underground cable easements is, is prohibited. Um, but in terms of uh, normal cultivation, um, growing uh, hay, silage, um, cattle grazing, etc., those activities typically can, can continue over underground cables. Thanks, Barton. Um, the next question is from Fred, and we, we're very aware that there's a lot of eagles uh, in the area. Um, and Fred's just um, asked, um, you know, will there be any impacts on the, on the eagles? Uh, thank you, uh, Nancy and Fred, for that question. Um, one of the considerations that, that we were brought to our attention for the Parwin Valley was that the, the high um, numbers of eagles in that valley and utilising the valley as a flyway along the Rowsley Scarp. It was a key factor in the planning decision for the Yaloke South Wind Farm uh, and a, a, another reason why the infrastructure was pushed back from the, the Scarp was to basically try and put some distance between the eagles utilising that feature and, and the infrastructure and so running a transmission line through the Parwin Valley and up over the Rowsley Scarp would introduce uh, an obstacle in the landscape. Having said that, the size of the infrastructure, as you would have seen in the opening slide, is such that it generally um, is visible to eagles and not an issue. Um, whereas you know, distribution lines and single wire earth return lines out to pumps than that are often a greater hazard to eagles. What we also found was that there are eagles up through Long Forest and up around Meramu Reservoir, but the density is not as high as in the Parwin Valley. Great, thank you. Uh, moving to easements again, um, Randall has asked a question, what is the difference uh, between easements um, for, for the difference between the HVAC and the HVDC? You touched Certainly. on the presentation, so just probably a little bit of further detail there. Certainly. So with obviously with HVDC, um, it's, it, it can be a narrower easement. Uh, in, in that example that you saw there, it, it, it would possibly be around about 20 metres. It depends on, on what that uh, asset owner um, desires to protect the cable and allow it to maintain it. Um, with HVAC cables where you need the two trenches and greater separation, obviously you need the 30 metre or wider easement to, to achieve that. But the construction workspace is typically much wider than the easement, simply because of the space requirements. And the easement itself, it provides the um, legal protection of the asset, the right to occupy and uh, maintain the asset on a person's land. And so it's, it's often narrower. And so in, in answer to your question, typically HVDC easements are narrower than HVAC easements. Thanks, Barton. Um, the next question is from Jim and Susan, and they have asked, um, what, what are some of the, what, what environmental and socioeconomic impacts and constraints uh, have we identified uh, within the, um, the, the current single corridor that we have? Um, and the second part of that question is, uh, what weighting do we apply to those uh, impacts um, as opposed to other constraints? Thanks, right. Nancy. I'm just noting down the two halves of the yeah. question so I don't forget them. Great. Um, thank you for your patience. No worries. Um, so I might answer your second question first, if I may. Um, we don't wait 
um, criteria. And the reason we don't rate, rate uh, weight criteria is it's very subjective. Um, we were involved in an exercise some 15 years ago um, where we were directed to, to look at weighting criteria. And so we brought all the key stakeholders together and technical experts together and we set about weighting the criteria. And what we found obviously was that um, a cultural heritage expert, for example, would put a high weighting, high weighting on, on that aspect because of the importance and significance of that to Aboriginal people. A, a bio, biologist, a technical specialist in biology or ecology would put a high weighting on that um, because of impacts on ecosystems and threatened species. And what we found was that it was inconclusive at the end. Weightings were also tested in the Shepherd and Bypass project. Um, it was initially investigated using weightings. And again, it, it, it was inconclusive and it resulted in the analysis of those corridors reverting to a discussion of the key differences and the merit advantages and disadvantages. And so we have not supposed to apply a weighting um, to be subjective in that. We've simply looked at the data on its merits, the um, length, areas impacted, et cetera, what the uh, land use controls are, are, are requiring, what the overlays are trying to do, and discuss those issues on the basis of their material differences and merits. And so that's why we don't use weighting. In terms of the environmental um, constraints and issues that we've identified in the corridor, um, they relate um, to the grasslands. Um, we are still traversing grasslands between Sydenham and Kamida. Uh, we've got the uh, long forest grey box woodland that extends up to the Meramu Reservoir and then around it, which is also a wildlife corridor. Uh, we have the um, very high constraint imposed by um, visual amenity at Dali uh, and in the Lerderderg Valley and on Swans Road. Uh, we have various agricultural constraints um, in the as we go west from there and particularly as we approach um, north of Ballarat there. And as you would have seen in the um, constraint, the least constrained corridor, and you probably wouldn't have picked up in the matrices that I showed earlier, but one of the things that those matrices showed us was that getting to the Ballarat to Bendigo line as, as quickly as possible and staying with it as long as possible was an effective way of managing impacts on, on those potato growing areas. And the reason I say that is that what we were trying to avoid and what was obvious in some of the corridors that were investigated was that you could create an island effect where you had one transmission line converging on another over a long distance and that's something that that in my experience and from my um, professional um, opinion is not desirable and so we we that came out through the analysis. And so that was a consequence of then um, taking the, the route to that line or the corridor to that line, along that line, and then peeling off. So we, we've very much recognized the issues associated with the, the potato growing area. As we move west, we, we pass by the area that's being um, uh, nominated for, well, uh, UNESCO listing, um, the Gold Mines precinct around Clunes, Smeaton, and extending through to Dalesford. So we do, do pass across the edge of that. And then we enter into um, various areas of uh, scenic value um, as we go out around Mount Beckworth, uh, Mount Bolton, and then further on past Lexton out into to the Broadacre areas as we, we move west. What we also find as we move west is that we start to encounter, as we do around Melton and Bacchus Marsh, wind farms and the infrastructure associated with them. And so 
that that is a, a very quick summary summary of the the constraints and issues that we see in that corridor. Great, thanks for that, Barton. Um, Tony has asked a question: uh, Will there be photo montages um, or you know the virtual reality, the VR model for the community to be able to see the transmission line for, from different vantage points um, along the alignment? Yes, there will be. So there will there will be um, a very um, detailed landscape and visual assessment um, is is being undertaken for this project, given the 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 constraint that um, um, such infrastructure has on landscape and visual values. And that will include the preparation of montages so that people can understand the, the scale and appearance within the landscape. It will also include the production of virtual reality at um, strategic locations of high um, public exposure to, to the infrastructure. Um, including around Bali, um, further west, and in around the gold fields. So we are we are hoping through that work that people will get a, a very good appreciation of of what this infrastructure might look like in the landscape. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a, a question from Ernie. Uh, so why has a single corridor widened in some areas from the multiple from the multiple corridors? Um, that were announced in February. Um, and so therefore, why am I now affected when I wasn't affected before? The, uh, Ernie has asked that question. So it, it relates to these factors, Bernie, and that is that, as you'd appreciate from the process diagram that I showed earlier, um, as information progressively becomes more available, more detailed, um, we're able to to better understand um, whether in fact there are constructible um, routes within the corridors. And so what we, what we found was that the corridors that were identified previously were on the basis of narrowing a corridor. The subsequent work that was done that I outlined in the earlier slides looked at uh, going down or, or effectively working backwards rather than forwards. And so we then looked at how you might link up the areas of least constraint um, rather than trying to shrink a big area to a smaller area. And through that work, we identified that on the basis of what we understood about the least or moderately constrained areas, and in some instances, the highly constrained areas, that in order to allow us to in fully investigate um, all prudent and feasible alternatives in those areas, we needed to widen the corridor a bit. Um, in some areas, um, there was more, um, there were other factors driving um, the corridor, uh, which allowed us to narrow it. Um, but in some areas, um, there are a range of factors about which further information is required. And so consequently, uh, it was widened in those areas to allow that, that investigation. Great, thank you. Um, now, I've just got uh, a question from uh, Gabrielle. It's, um, it's sort of a two part, it's two questions, but they're um, in um, talking about financial support. Um, and we, we are hosting a webinar on uh, compensation um, coming up in the next fortnight. But the question from Gabrielle is around financial support from farmers um, who would need to adapt um, their farming practices, uh, both for um, the above ground transmission lines um, and is, will they limit any of those farming, farming pra practices? Um. I will, I will answer your question in part. Um, and the reason I say that is um, uh, compensation is a matter for Osnet. Um, I will let you know that there is a compensation framework that's um, regulated by the Land Acquisition and Compensation Act, which sets out the prescriptions on what, that, what must be compensated through these processes and through these activities. And essentially compensation equates to um, four 
four elements or four components. So there's compensation for the, what we call the acquisition of the easement. And that takes into account the extent to which acquiring an easement might devalue the property. It takes into account special circumstances and special values of the property. And it takes into account a, a, a term called solatum, which relates to how does the easement change the way you might be uh, using and, and managing and developing the property. And so the compensation for such infrastructure and easements is, is built up for those three components. There is another what we call head of compensation, which relates to um, disturbance during construction. And that's a separate um, head, of, uh, head of compensation. So it's completely separate to the acquisition of the easement on your property. In regards to adapting to the infrastructure, as I explained before, the primary um, objective through route selection is to try and design out the impacts. And so what we will be doing is working through that as to the best of our knowledge to try and design out impacts. So by careful placement of towers so that they don't create additional impact on properties um, in terms of how they manage the properties, for example, how they cultivate, uh, rotate, sell, graze, et cetera. We'll also be looking at, uh, and um, the agricultural specialist will talk more about this and what types of um, machinery are used on the property and the height clearances that are required to allow that machinery to freely operate. And we can manage that by raising the towers um, to create greater clearance in some areas if it's required. So we manage um, the change to um, properties and the farming activities that are conducted on them, um, principally through the design and route selection and then what can't be managed through that if there are still um, some constraints or restrictions or impacts on, on the activities and on the property, then they're dealt with through the compensation package. Thanks, Barton. Um, the next two questions, I'll ask them separately, but they're from Jim and Susan, uh, and they're uh, in relation to underground undergrounding um, so in your presentation, you talked about the considerations, the technology, the technology considerations that related to HVAC. Um, are you able to talk about the equivalent, um, the equivalent considerations for HVDC, please? Certainly. Um, so what I might do is I'll just duck back to, to these considerations. So. In, re in regards to HVDC, terrain is still a significant constraint for the same reasons I outlined earlier, um, that we still don't want to run HVDC cables across the side of hills or through difficult terrain. Um, we still have the same issue where to dig a trench, as you saw in the later slides, uh, we still need to, to disturb basically every metre, except where we can drill under features. Um, the workspace will typically be about the same, about 30 metres wide. And, and that's the reason for that is that we still need to manage um, the material that comes out of the trench. Uh, we still need to bring in, as I said, those, those heavy trucks with the 30 tonne cable drums. We still need to have safe workspaces. So it's about the same. The trenches um, are similar in that they are about 1.5 metres deep. The reason they are about that deep is that in both HVAC and HVDC, and we want to achieve it ultimately about one metre cover over the cables. Um, if we go deeper, um, then the thermal dissipation, um, the, the, the dissipation of heat generated by the cables becomes more problematic. And to overcome that, um, sometimes you need to go to a much heavier cable which as you can appreciate, obviously increases cost. Um, the trenches are narrower, um, typically around um, one to two metres wide to accommodate um, a single HVDC link or circuit. 
Um, as you can appreciate from the pictures, there are only two cables. There can be three depending on how the HVDC um, circuit is configured. Um, joint pits are about the same. Um, and the reason for that is that HVDC cables are a heavier cable. They're a much bigger cross-sectional area uh, because of the fact that one cable is carrying the, all of the current and the other one the return current. And so we still end up with about 500 to 1100 metres per drum. So that doesn't change and we still need heavy vehicle access. So the key difference is ultimately the um, width of the easement. In terms of construction and constructability issues, they're very similar for both. Great, thank you. Um, and look, the other question on undergrounding was around um, uh, the difference between the, um, the converter stations for um, HVDC and HVAC, one being end-to-end -end and one requiring a converter, the DC requiring a converter station every 25 kilometres, give or take. Um, so, and thing that, um, sorry, the Star of the South Wind Farm, so they're proposing underground for about 70, 80 kilometres. Can we comment on the relative cost of reactive plant needed for um, those underground options? Um, I, I can give a very broad indication of the cost and it, it relates to the voltage. Um, so with HVDC, um, you don't need reactive plant um, because of the nature of the fact that there are much less losses um, with HVDC and that's why it's typically used over very long distances. So for example, Bass Link's around about 385 kilometres. Marinus Link will be about 360 kilometres. Um, some of the interconnectors in Canada and the Europe are up around 7, 800, 900, 1200 kilometres. So typically that's where HVDC is used. And in order to transform the, the energy from AC to DC, you need what's called a converter station at each end. So one at Sydenham, for example, and one at Polgana. And they are roughly about 250 million each. Um, and so if you wanted to, for example, cut into a HVDC circuit at say Ballarat North or Warbra or wherever, you have to put what we call back-to-back -back converter stations. So one to bring it from DC back to AC, then you make your connection at AC because that's what most all of the rest of the network operates at. And then you transform it back to HVDC. And so every time you want to cut into a HVDC line, which is typically not done, um, you incur a cost of something like 10 or more times to do the equivalent cut in for a HVAC. With the reactive plants, um, they're in the tens of millions of dollars um, to install those um, at 25 kilometre intervals. Thanks. Does that adequately answer that question? Have I covered off the two yeah. parts? Yeah, you've covered off the two parts. Um, and we can follow up, if not, um, uh, on the website. But yes, that is the two parts. Um, the, the next question, um, Darren and Randall have asked the same question, just commenting on, did AMO uh, set the criteria for the route or the, the single corridor or the route? Uh, I'm not sure what's meant by that question. If you're referring to the route selection criteria um, and the technical specification and constructability, no, they didn't. That was, um, that was developed by myself in consultation with um, Osnet's engineers from a terms of constructability, um, in consultation with um, um, Osnet again in terms of the technical specification and in regards to the environmental, social and cultural heritage criteria, they are the criteria that um, we have used on numerous um, linear infrastructure projects, both in Australia and internationally. 
So in summary, no, OSNET did not prescribe the criteria that we used. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a question from Bruno. Um, so it's in regards to the overhead towers. Um, you've mentioned, you've talked about easement widths of um, about 40 metres for the 220 and about 80 metres for the 500. Um, the, the question is, so how, how far apart uh, are those towers? Um, just to provide an ind indication of um, how many towers there might be. Certainly. So for 220 kV uh, double circuit transmission lines, the, what we call the span length or the distance between two towers is around about 400 to 500 metres. And it's very similar for 500 um, kV transmission lines, double circuit transmission lines. Um, because, and the reason it is, is because the, the electrical clearance required to a 220 is less than required to a 500 kV. And so we can achieve the same span length because we are uh, effectively the conductors or wires are allowed to be closer to the ground than they are for a 500 kV, even though the 500 kV conductors, as you would appreciate from the opening slide, are somewhat bigger and heavier than for a 220 kV. Great, thank you. Um, and a question from Marissa. Um, we bought some land uh, and have a building contract um, and uh, they've provided those plans to Osnet and they're still within that single corridor. Um, so the question is just, you know, um, why weren't those plans taken into consideration um, uh, in, this, in this planning phase? So the, the work that we've outlined um, today is about um, moving from a shortlisted corridors to a corridor. Um, the work that will progress now and is progressing now is to identify and re evaluate um, prudent and feasible routes within that corridor. And so uh, issues and concerns like has just been raised uh, will be taken into consideration as we do that work. Um, thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Barton. Um, we have, that's, uh, we've answered my, uh, most of the questions there. I absolutely will note that some questions that may not have been answered um, just are not directly related to this webinar. So as I did note at the start, we will take those questions and um, make sure they, they get to that relevant technical specialist for the upcoming webinars in the next fortnight. Um, I, oh, there is, sorry, one <laughs> question just coming through at the moment and then I'll uh, move through. Um, so that question is, uh, will, will, there be, will, will there be a substation constructed on, along the route which will provide um, electricity for, for locals? Um, and that question is from John. Thank you, John. Um, the proposal that's been put forward um, for, this, for this project is for a, a 500 kV or 220 kV or combination thereof transmission line. And typically that's a point to point transfer, um, allowing for connections along the way. The supply that you get uh, at your house and, and for industry and that is typically at 22 kV. And it's serviced by what we call the 66 kV network, which then connects back to um, substations of this, of this type. At this stage, um, from the technical specification that I've been provided with, um, there is no intention to have a 500 kV to 220 kV to 66 kV um, transformer arrangement at the substations. Um, they are being, your supply and other suppliers being serviced via other substations on what we call the sub-transmission or 66 kV network. Right. Um, and just a, another question that's come from Russell. Uh, Barton, can you talk to us about the minimum clearance to houses, um, horse stables, et cetera, from the transmission line? 
certainly. Um, so the, the, the easement is designed to provide the minimum clearance. So the easement is designed, its width is determined by a number of factors. It's determined by the electrical safety requirements. And that relates in part to how high the towers are and how high the conductors are above the ground. Also, as you would appreciate on a windy day, if you've observed the existing transmission lines out there, the conductors will sway in what we call mid-span. That's halfway between the two towers and they sway out in the wind. And so the easement um, has to be wide enough to accommodate that sway and still maintain the electrical safety clearances. Um, it also needs to be wide enough and the wires or conductors high enough off the ground to achieve um, our PANS's um, guidelines for uh, electric and magnetic fields. And the third one is that it needs to be um, sufficiently wide, particularly when you are in forested or native vegetation environments, that trees are not going to fall onto the transmission line. And so those factors contribute to the width of the easement. And so in terms of houses and proximity to houses, as you would have noted in the opening slide, which I'll go back to. Apologies for the flicker. Um, this slide here, you can see that um, houses have built up to the uh, easement, the existing 500 kV easement. So in, in this sense, the minimum separation is the edge of the easement. In that case, there will be setbacks that councils will have provided. So those houses will not be on the fence, but they'll be set back within the property in accordance with council requirements. So the minimum separation between transmission lines like this and houses is the easement plus whatever setbacks the council imposes. In regards to route selection um, and, and actually identifying routes, we, we adopt a nominal separation from houses as a starting point to try and achieve as, as much separation as we can. And as I explained in the earlier session today, uh, we use around 300 metres. Uh, and the reason we use that is because um, there's well published literature of people who are concerned about electric and magnetic fields, that at that distance, there are no effects, even though all of the, the studies and the scientific literature indicates that if the transmission line is the appropriate height and it's maintained appropriately, that, that people will not be exposed to electric and magnetic fields. And so we adopt that nominal offset of around 300 metres as a starting point. We can't always achieve that um, because as you'd appreciate, as you get closer to towns, as you get closer to rural residential areas, as you get closer to Melbourne, the density of houses increases. But notwithstanding that, our objective in, in the work that I've been involved in and the work that I do is to start with around 300 metres, noting that in some instances we can't achieve that. But the priority in those situations is to, within the available constraints, maximise the separation. Thanks for that, Barton. Uh, and thanks for, for answering all those questions. Um, I am just going to now close this session uh, and just um, provide you with some information on some upcoming webinars. So I'll just grab... Um, I'll just stop I'll sharing. Just, yeah, I'll we'll just change screens over. But uh, while we are doing that, um, I'll just share that screen. Uh, that should be there. So look, so... On behalf of the project team tonight, I'd like to really thank everyone for their attendance this evening and for sending through all of those questions. Um, as I said, we uh, did get through the, the questions that were related to this topic tonight about the, 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 the corridor selection process uh, and any questions that we haven't answered, we will answer those um, in the upcoming webinars um, and 
hand those on to those relevant um, technical specialists. Uh, we will be sending out a link uh, tomorrow um, about an online survey. Um, and we're just really interested in your feedback um, and information on what you've heard tonight uh, in this presentation. Uh, we will also pop the, the link uh, in the chat function, um, but we will send that to the uh, registered email, the email address that you registered with to attend uh, this webinar tonight. Uh, in the coming fortnight, um, we do have some further, further webinars. So next week, uh, on Tuesday, the 21st of September, we have biodiversity. Uh, on Wednesday, the 22nd, we have uh, compensation and evaluation, which we'll be able to answer um, in more detail some of those questions that were asked tonight about compensation. Uh, Thursday, the 23rd of September is uh, electric uh, and magnetic fields. And then the following week, on Tuesday, the 28th of September, we have uh, bushfire. Uh, Wednesday, the 29th, 9th of September is agriculture, uh, and then Thursday the 30th is landscape uh, and visual amenity. All those sessions start uh, at 7.30 and conclude at 8.30. And then following those two weeks, starting in October, uh, we have um, some one-on-one -on -one, uh, sessions with a technical specialist. So we have uh, sent out uh, some information via e-update and is also on our website. Um, and we can get this information out to you in other ways if you haven't got a great uh, access to, um, to the internet. We'll be booking, you have the opportunity to book in uh, a one-on-one -on -one session with a technical specialist, um, and you can do so online at the moment or be in touch with one of the project team. So the technical specialist sessions will include those ones that I've just talked about in the webinars, which are agriculture, biodiversity, bushfire, um, the electric magnetic fields, compensation, uh, valuation, and we'll also have a session on environmental approvals. So if you'd like to book uh, into any of those sessions for a 30 minute one on one conversation with those technical specialists, please um, jump on to the website and do so or be in touch uh, with the project email and we can book you in for those sessions. I'd just like to um, uh, acknowledge that we absolutely do understand that this project uh, causes uncertainty and concern from many members of the community. And we do encourage you to reach out uh, for support services for the providers that are listed on the screen there, um, if, if you need to reach out to those uh, support services. Um, these services are entirely confidential and free to access. Um, and they are also listed on our website or equally we can provide you with that information um, if you would like to send an email or call the project. Thanks everyone for attending tonight. Really appreciate the participation um, and have a great evening all. Thank you.